my name is Prashant Kumar. Uh, I was one of the founders of uh, 128 Technology. Uh, now a part of Juniper Network's product management team. Uh, and in this session, we're going to speak about uh, session smart networking. So we started uh, 128 Technology in 2014 uh, and Juniper acquired us in 2020. Uh, when Juniper acquired us, we had around 120 employees. Um, we had already 50 patents approved and globally we had more than 300 customers. And I've given a profile of our customers in the right side of the slide. If you look at the profile, uh, we have the largest pharmacy chain in US uh, deploying us in more than 10,000 um, pharmacies right now. We are already deployed in 2,000 pharmacies and 8,000 uh, pharmacies are planned for this year. We have the largest hospital chain in US, uh, around 800 hospitals and clinics uh, deploying 128 routers. Um, we, uh, we are deployed in more than three years uh, in the largest auto parts store in US. Uh, and we have consistently provided them five line reliability. Uh, Department of Defense, we have been working with Department of Defense for the last three years. We have multiple projects going on with Air Force and Army. And the largest payroll provider in the US um, has been our customer from three years. Uh, they have deployed us in both Edge and in their core network. And the largest oil services provider in the US um, has been working with us for three years. Again, uh, deployed us in multiple uh, use cases. So, so my question to the team is that um, there, are, there are more than 64 uh, SD-WAN vendors in the market. Why did this high profile uh, customer choose 128 technology? I'm gonna answer that question in the next 10 minutes. So when we started 128 technology in 2014, uh, we looked at multiple network elements. You have routers deployed in multiple locations in the network, and then you have uh, load balancers, you have DPI devices, you have the IDS IPS devices and next generation firewalls usually deployed in the perimeter or in the core, right? So we looked at the routers, said that it's been, it's, it's been deployed in multiple parts in the network uh, and there is no innovation in the routing from last 25 years. So then uh, we looked at why do people build networks? People build networks for running services and applications and the language of which is sessions, either TCP or UDP sessions. Then we looked at all the network devices, uh, as I said, right? Except for the routers, every other devices, uh, device in the network spoke the language of, service, uh, of services and, and application, that is sessions. So we said, if we can actually make a router uh, speak the language of services and applications, we will be able to build a service-centric uh, enterprise fabric, which is completely aware of all the services and applications running in the network, which is very powerful and has a lot of applications. Um, the, the most three most uh, used applications uh, for the session smart networking from 120 technologies. Uh, the first one is WAN, SD WAN. Um, if you think about the, the customer profile I, I mentioned, the largest pharmacy chain, the hospital chain, and the <clears throat> and the uh, auto parts store, they use us for SD WAN. The second use case is zero trust security. Uh, the the US uh, the Department of Defense and the payroll provider uses for the, the zero to security. And the third uh, use case is a low bandwidth secure link. The, the oil services provider uses for the low bandwidth uh, secure link. Now, the question I have is that how did we build this uh, session smart routing technology? Uh, the two fundamental uh, fundamental principles on which we build this session smart uh, networking is the first one is our data model. And the second one is uh, secure vector routing, tunnel free way of routing. So let's walk through it. Everything in 128 technology is based on this data model, authority, tenants, and service. So if you think about Juniper as uh, an enterprise, right? On the 128 technology router, you define Juniper as an authority, and then you have tenants and services. Uh, if you think about Juniper, uh, and let's assume that Juniper has three departments, engineering, marketing, and sales. So you define three tenants on the 128 technology router, engineering, marketing, and uh, sales. And then let's assume that engineering accesses uh, two services. Uh, let's assume that it's Git, GitHub and Bitbucket. So you define two services, uh, Bit, uh, uh, GitHub and Bitbucket, and you explicit, explicit, explicitly specify in the access policy that the only uh, tenant which is allowed to access these services is engineering. So what you have done is that you have defined Juniper as an authority. You have defined two, uh, three tenants, engineering, marketing, and sales. And then you have de defined two services, GitHub and Bitbucket. And in the access policy in the service, you said that the only, um, 
the only uh, tenant which can access these two services is um, engineering, okay? Now, if you look at this, right? And if you look at any other router in the market, every router in the market as allowed by default policy. That is, when a router gets a packet, uh, it looks at the forwarding table and forward the packet to the next hop. That's what any router does. Unlike regular router, uh, 128 technology router has a default policy of deny by default. So when a packet comes to the 128 router, the very first thing we do is that we see whether the packet belongs to tenant, uh, the tenant defined on the product. In, in my example, the tenants are engineering, marketing, and sales. If the source prefix of the packet do not match engineering, marketing, or sales, 128 router is going to drop the packet and audit log it. Um, let's assume that it matches the tenant. Now, at the tenant level, you can see that you can define unique security policy per tenant. That's for engineering, I can say that any packet belonging to engineering tenant has to be encrypted and per packet authenticated based on the security policy defined uh, under that tenant, right? So what we do is that when a packet goes between all the 128 router in this service-centric fabric, all the packet belonging to engineering tenant will be encrypted using that security policy. Okay, so when the packet comes into the 128 router, we look at the source prefix, we match the tenant, now, once the tenant match is done, then the very next thing we do is that we look at the, the destination of the packet and see whether the destination matches the service the tenant is allowed to access. In the case of engineering, as I said, it's Bitbucket and GitHub. If engineering is trying to access anything other than Git, uh, GitHub and Bitbucket, we're going to drop the packet. However, if the, uh, if the engineering is trying to access um, GitHub or Bitbucket, the next thing you can do is that at every service level, you can define service policies. Service policies define exactly how the route, uh, the packet will be routed. For example, in this case, let's assume that uh, that you you want to attach exact SLA parameters for that particular service, right? If the, the if the service is voice, right? Voice is um, very sensitive to packet loss, jitter, and latency, and you want to take a link with the minimum packet loss, jitter, and, uh, and latency. That's exactly what SD-WAN is all about, right? You're attaching SLA at the service level, and you're routing the packet based on the SLA requirement of the service. In addition to the SLA requirement, you can also uh, specify the, the, the QAS policies. Uh, what should be the policing and shaping policy for this particular service? And you can also define the load balancing um, policy, right? So as I said, when the packet comes in, we look at the source prefix, match the tenant, and based on the destination prefix, we match the service and do the service policy matching and, the, and route the packet to the next 128T router. This is the first innovation we have done. The second innovation is tunnel-free secure vector routing. So I'm going to just build this slide. Okay, so once the packet comes to the, so I've shown a network with multiple uh, se uh, session smart routers deployed. Once the packet comes to the first session smart router, the very first thing we do as, is, as I said is that match the tenants and services. Once the, the match of the tenant and service is done, what we do is that when we ship the packet to the next SSR in the network, the very first thing, very first thing we do is that we double net the packet. Uh, so there is no tunneling. Instead of doing tunneling, we double net the packet. Uh, we take the original source IP uh, and port and original destination IP and port and, and all the policy matching along with the tenant that the packet belongs to. We put that in a metadata in the very first packet. We sign the metadata, we encrypt the metadata and send the packet to the next session smart router, okay? So when the next session smart router get the packet, uh, it decrypt the pack, uh, it uh, verifies the, the signature on the metadata, it decrypts the packet, it gets all the service and policy information from the packet, um, and it creates a session state for that particular session uh, on that router and ships, it does the exact same thing again. It um, creates a new metadata, attaches uh, a new uh, double natted IP address, and se send the packet to the next SSR and so on, right? And once it reaches the end SSR, as shown in the picture, right, what the, the last SSR will do is that it takes the original source IP and destination IP and stamps it back on the packet and, uh, and forwards it to the destination. So what we've done with this whole process is that we have created a secure service-centric fabric. Every packet between two 128 routers will be encrypted based on the policy uh, defined in the tenant, will be routed uh, based on the SLA uh, specified in the service policy, uh, and uh, you you have end-to-end -end visibility. So if you think about the whole network, right? When a session is created on the first SSR, it, it gets a, uh, assigned a unique session ID, and the same session ID is carried through all the SSR routers in the network. 
So this is, uh, we call this as secure vector routing, tunnel-free secure vector routing. We call it as tunnel-free because we don't use IPsec. So there is no tunneling or adding another uh, uh, header on top of the packet. We just double nat the packet between two 180 routers. So, Prashant, um, quick question. This, I guess this will be the second IPv6 uh, question of the, of the presentation. Um, since you shouldn't really be natting on with, with v6, um, how do you handle the, uh, the session fabric in a v6-only environment? Uh, so today what we do is that for the v6, uh, we have a deployment in Japan uh, where uh, we are carrying IPv4 packets over IPv6. That will be a regular IPv6 packet, but the, 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 the IP address of the packet will, would, would be the, the IP address of the SSR interface in the WAN side. Okay. Okay. All right. So, yep. you, so you're just you're just tagging on the uh, the is it the the egress interface to uh, to get the v6 going? All right. So this is one of the deployment uh, use cases uh, I'm going to walk through. This is the auto part store. As I said, we have 11,000 uh, routers deployed in this network from last uh, three years. Uh, the, the requirement of the customer was that uh, every phone call is worth $100 for this customer. They wanted to make sure that they never lose a phone call, just never. Uh, so that's what we have built. Uh, what we have done is that, uh, as you can see from the picture here, right? There are three interfaces. Uh, uh, every every store has three interfaces. One is the LTE, second one is broadband, and third is MPLS. And every store has two 12080 routers deployed in the HA mode. And uh, one of the advantage we have is that, given the fact that we are tunnel free, right? Uh, we can provide sub-second failover uh, from a broadband to the LTE network, a really sub-second failover. We are the only ones who can do it. Uh, because we don't have to pre-establish IPsec tunnel. There are no tunnels in a 12080 router, right? Um, the second model is that, the second most important thing in the picture here is that, that the HA, we are completely session stateful in the HA model, right? When you are switching from uh, the MPLS network, let's assume that that 12080 router goes down, right? All the session state is already there in, in the other 12080 router. So it's session stateful in nature. A switchover happens in sub-second uh, timeframe and and as I said, we have provided 99.99% reliability for this auto part store in last three years. And they have been one of the greatest reference for us when Juniper acquired us. And cost savings as well, by the way. Again, is, is the 128 router a separate, or, or is it a separate system, virtual machine, whatever, or is this something that integrates with SRX or something you can migrate from SRX to 128? By the way, very good question. I, I missed that point. 128 uh, router, uh, session smart router is a completely software based. Um, we don't sell hardware, right? Uh, it's all software, uh, runs on a uh, white box. Uh, currently we have um, partnered with Silicon and Lanner through Arrow. You can buy a um, 128 router as a appliance through Arrow. Uh, we can, today we cannot run on SRX, okay? Uh, however, uh, for next generation firewall, right? Uh, if you want to uh, service function chain 128, uh, so you, we can. So 128 run, runs on uh, a bare metal uh, uh, white box. We can run on the cloud. We, we are like any cloud you want, right? We, we are there. Uh, we can run as a virtual machine on any hypervisor. Uh, so one of, one of the ways our customers are deploying 128 router yeah. with SRX is uh, uh, we run on the bare metal mode and they run uh, SRX in the VNF mode and we service function chain with SRX. And so, so here's our, actually our very clear thought process. We, we've announced when we launched the acquisition, right? So we have many large SRX customers that are continuing to deploy SRX. Um, you know, the, the whole premise of the acquisition of 128D, and by the way, we had an opportunity to look at every single SD-WAN player that was not a public player. You know, we literally looked at everybody that, that was not part of a big company. And, and, you know, this technology really stood out for us. And the key consideration was that it is a software router. If you're buying SRXs today, our absolute intent is that the SSR, Session Smart Routing Technology, is going to come into Juno's um, you know, uh, as, as a software add-on onto this. So if you're deploying SRXs, if you have SRXs, stay with that platform. 
if you're if you're buying brand new and uh, you know you want to uh, jump on the deep end with 128, uh, that's where you go into white boxes. If you want the best of both, we have a great platform for that. We have uh, NFX, which basically you know supports an SRX um, as the base, base platform, and 128T runs as a VNF on the NFX, and we actually have several customers deployed in production in that mode as well, right? So it, it, it truly was in so many ways a perfect fit so to, to continue the SRX um, uh, you know, family and longevity there and get to next gen um, uh, where necessary. So those are the three choices we, uh, we have for our customers. Yeah, uh, just to add to what Sudhir said, uh, in the NFX, uh, many of our customers are actually running uh, 12080 in the SRIOV mode. Uh, you get very close to the the bare metal performance with uh, enabling SRI UV. Um, it's it just runs, so it's great. So we do have a we do have another question that came up on uh, on Twitter from Faisal Khan. He asks, uh, "What's being presented has always been uh, been there in 128 technologies, and he'd like to know what's the benefit of integrating 128 into the Mist AI." One of the things we do well is. Um, we are session aware, right? We keep a lot of analytics, a lot of statistics. The amount of data we collect per session is just unbelievable, right? And so currently we, we send that, uh, and people have created their own models. The largest pharmacy chain build their own tool, right? With complete visibility of their network, what's happening, because we provide all that data, right? So the integration with MIST, uh, with providing client to cloud story uh, and integration into Marvis, that is a huge, um, uh, Huge step for us, and and, that, and that's one of the highest priority project for us. And so, there, I know you want to add a lot in that area. Go ahead, Brian. It's quite simply the day one, day two operations. You know, you spend you know seven years with the router that you buy, and and can you apply AI to it, right? So that's what you know. We have SRX customers and 128 customers, but the common binding fabric across all of this is Mist AI. Right. Uh, so, uh, so on that note, Brian, you're going to get a missed AI T-shirt. Thanks for the question. Uh, so, <laughs> I was asking on behalf of someone else. So, but yeah. Um, you know, one of the key elements to to a lot of SD-WAN platforms is is you know QoS win remediation. Some of the ways that not only uh, it improves blackout conditions, but brownout conditions where you got you have lossy conditions over links. So, I just wanted to ask if there was anything in, in the 128 tech if you guys could talk about. You know, how, if you guys have any of those mechanisms for error correction, uh, you know, uh, packet uh, de uh, duplication or uh, uh, those types of features. Definitely. Uh, so we have uh, we have a packet duplication, deduplication uh, across multiple links. In fact, we can do duplication of the packet on a single link. We we have uh, one of the one of the service providers in uh, uh, in Africa uh, deploying us uh, on a single link, uh, they are uh, doing packet duplication. So we have all those features required to make sure that we can provide the highest MOS score for voice because that's very important for MOS for voice. Yeah, and one last question. How do you guys deal with uh, cloud-based apps? So not just site-to-site -site connectivity, but site-to-cloud. Yeah, so uh, we, we do multiple things with uh, cloud-based apps. The first thing is that, so if you think about Let's take O365 as an example, right? Uh, what Microsoft says is that for O365, just offload it at the edge of the network. Don't even, don't even SD-WAN it, right? Just offload it at the edge. So what we do is that we recognize multiple, we can recognize multiple web-based apps, for example, Zoom, right? You can recognize Zoom today uh, on 128 technology, and we will assign a different traffic engineering uh, priority for that, highest traffic engineering priority for that, right? So that's how, so, we can recognize a lot of SaaS applications and you can apply different treatments. You can either offload it, you can do traffic engineering and so 